So, Ephesians chapter 3, it's been a privilege to be here, a very brief, less than 24 hours, and I'm gone back to my responsibilities at home, and I take away happy memories of the brief visit and uh, of my fellowship and friendship with you in the gospel, the warmth of your welcome, your care for me, all of that is, does not go unnoticed and is greatly appreciated. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Father, we pray, make the book live to me, O Lord. Show me yourself within your word. Show me myself. Show me my Savior. And make the book live to me. We pray for the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name, amen. Well, what I'd like to do in this... Uh, second session this morning, the final time that I have with you, is essentially uh, just join Paul as he bursts forth into praise in the doxology that we find there in verses 20 and 21. It's important uh, to set that in something of a context and to acknowledge the fact that we get an insight into the heart of a pastor in this case, into the pastoral heart of Paul, when more even than in his preaching, in his praying, we find out what is really the burden of his life in relationship to those who are under his care. And there is an insight into a person when we pray with them or when we are privileged to hear them pray. As Spurgeon used to say to his students as they went out into pastoral ministry, let somebody else preach for you, but do not allow somebody else to do your pastoral prayer. Because it is as you pray for your people week by week and day by day that they actually begin to get a sense of your heart and your burden for them. And certainly that is true when we consider the, the prayers of Paul as he prays for these various churches. And here in this second prayer that we find in Ephesians, uh, the earlier one I can leave to you uh, as homework. And what is it that he prays? He bows his knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. What does he pray? Well, he prays essentially for two things, that they may know an inner strength through God's Spirit, as verse 16, that God may, according to the riches of his glory, grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, as a result of that, that Christ may dwell in your hearts, and so on. And then he also prays for them to be able to comprehend the measureless love of Christ. In other words, his great concern for them is that they might know and understand God. Um, I think it's Calvin who talks about we never come to an understanding of ourselves until we have spent time on a devout, a devout musing of the Godhead. And after a devout musing of the Godhead, we descend, as it were, from there to an understanding of ourselves, which is, of course, the very reverse of a culture that says, I need to, first of all, know myself and understand myself, and if I get all of that figured out, then I may have time to consider the possibility of divinity. They actually, it's actually the reverse. And that's why um, a pastor like Spurgeon, even in his infancy of pastoring at the age of 20, is able to encourage his people along these lines. This is him addressing his congregation on the Lord's Day morning in 1855. And he says to them, and remember, he's 20 years old, would you lose your sorrows? Would you drown your cares? 
then go plunge yourself in the Godhead's deepest sea. Be lost in his immensity, and you shall come forth as from a couch of rest, refreshed and invigorated. I know of nothing which can so comfort the soul, so calm the swelling billows of sorrow and of grief, so speak peace to the winds of trial as a devout musing upon the subject of the Godhead. I'm sure there is far more to that than we even immediately recognize. Uh, we tend to think that uh, what, what we need uh, is, is, is practical information all the time. And we do need practical help in all kinds of areas. But Spurgeon is saying, you know, it is in the awareness of who God is, if you like, the Godness of God, that the, the, the strengthening in our inner being by the Holy Spirit, that the comprehending of the love and grace and goodness of God is foundational to these things. As the Puritans used to say, providence is a soft pillow. You can put your head on that pillow every night, no matter what is coming towards you, no matter the uncertainties that face you. And his concern here is, as verse 17 says, that they might be rooted and grounded in love, rooted and grounded. In other words, he uses a horticultural metaphor, and he uses an architectural metaphor, so that their roots may go deep down into the truth of God, and in the same way that their, that their, 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 uh, the, sh the, the, the framework of their life, the, the house of their life, if you like, in Matthew terminology, uh, that they will be those who have heard the Word of God and put it into practice, and they will be like a man whose house was founded upon a rock. And when the winds came and they blew and they beat upon the house, it stood firm. Or in Hebraic terms, that their anchor has gone into, uh, into that hold and is grounded safe in the love and goodness of God. Now, it is in light of that that he then says, and I want you to know this, this love of Christ. And I want to take just a moment uh, on this before we go into uh, this closing doxology. Uh, Paul uh, talks of this all the time. He's concerned when he writes to the church at Rome that they would understand that God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And it is this love that he wants to see expressed within the context of the Ephesian church. And in chapter 2, he has made it very clear, chapter 2, where verse 7, uh, he has been uh, looking forward to the, in, the way in which in the coming ages that he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Uh, so from immeasurable riches of God's grace, he turns then to the unknowable dimensions of God's love. Let me just point out a couple of things that may help as you follow this up on your own. As he prays in this way to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, you will notice, first of all, that this is not something that we are supposed to encounter, as it were, in our bedroom and on our own, but rather, verse 18, that we may have strength to comprehend. Notice the little phrase, with all the saints, with all the saints. Who are these people? Well, those who have been redeemed, who have been justified, who have been set free from the bondage to decay and have been made new men and women. In other words, it's just a small reminder, it's a passing reminder, but it is an important reminder that when God saves us, he, he, he unites us to Christ, and in uniting us to Christ, He unites us to one another. And in our union with Christ, we are inevitably united to one another. And it is in that union together that we make discoveries that may be uh, supplemented by our own personal journeys, but nevertheless, they are there to be discovered within the community of faith. And um, that is why the, 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 the contemporary concern of the millennials, I just did a thing here in Dallas a few weeks ago with a professor at DTS. We spent an hour, he wanted to ask me why it is that millennials see no interest at all in church, why they by and large have got no interest in it and, and feel that they might just as well operate their entire program from their, from their smartphone. 
and uh, we talked about it for an hour. I'm not sure I was any help to him at all, but it, 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 it speaks to a number of things. It speaks to the radical selfism which our generation has embraced, and also the sort of extraneous notion of whatever this church thing is. That's why when we pray for one another and we pray for our churches, we pray that there may be that genuine sense of a shared comprehension of the love of Christ that together with all the saints, we are saying to one another, come now, let us sing of a wonderful love, tender and true, and out of the heart of the Father above, streaming to me and to you, wonderful love out of the heart of the Father above. There is only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, uh, one God and Father of us all, and we are family. We don't have to get sentimental about this. We are family. Do you always get on with all your family? No, you have to say sorry. You have to say forgive me all the time. You have to learn to put up with each other, and whatever it might be. And it's true in the family of God. Romans, uh, Paul says, and try as best as is as, as in your jurisdiction to live at peace with people. Do your best. So, the church, you see, this is a digression, but I've started now, but the church, <laughs> the church is not a group of people that I would naturally want to go on holiday with. <laughs> the church is not a group of people that I would have hung around with in high school or would have hung around with me. Those of you who are clever mathematically, you know, nerdy engineer types, you don't want to hang with me. You wouldn't like me at school, and I wouldn't have been with you either. But now we're in the church, and we don't have, a, we don't have an option. But we don't feel bad because we don't have the sort of cozy feeling about everybody. This is the sort of Bill Gaither thing. I'm so glad that you're part of the family of God, you know? Be honest. Sing it properly. I'm surprised that you're part of the family of God. If you're not surprised, you ought to be surprised. Take a mirror and start there by being surprised that you are in the family of God. And he has put us in here. Building a church is like building with bananas. They're all funny shapes, soft bits, hard bits, the bit on the end that you can't do anything with. This is not, this is not a linear progression of people who are perfectly framed. This is the strangest bunch of people you ever saw in your life, and we are the family. And together as that family, he says, I pray that you be strengthened in your inner man so that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints the surpassing love of Jesus. So we won't comprehend it in isolation, but in family. We won't comprehend it and know it, and I needn't go over this again, uh, without thinking properly. We covered that this morning. The love of Christ, you will notice, is discovered and is displayed in surprisingly comprehensive terms, that you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints. Notice what is the breadth and length and height and depth. Well, what's the difference between height and depth? We usually measure spatial objects in terms of breadth, length, and either height or depth. But Paul here says four, that you might know the breadth and length and height and depth. Now, when you're doing home Bible studies and you come to something like this, don't allow yourself to spend the rest of the evening pondering why he says breadth and length and height and depth. Let me tell you why. Because what he's saying is this immeasurable dimension of the love of God just covers everything and transcends everything. When you go to your commentaries, you can find that the best of men have come up with their own explanation. Matthew Henry says, the reason he says this is because he wants us to understand that it is higher than heaven, that it is deeper than hell, that it is longer than the earth, and it is broader than the sea. Maybe. Another says it is broad enough to encompass all mankind. It is long enough to last for eternity. It is deep enough to reach the utmost degraded sinner, and it is high enough to exalt him to heaven. That's good, too. 
But we needn't really delay on it. You say, well, why are you delaying on it? Well, I'm about to stop delaying on it. I think it's simply that Christ's love needs to be seen not only in terms of its length and its breadth, in that it goes around the entire world, but as my friend Sinclair says, he is probably urging the Ephesians to contemplate the depth to which the Son of God stooped and the height to which the Son of God was exalted, having provided in his atonement the ultimate expression of his love for us. I think there's something in that. But at the end of the day, it is simply this magnificent expression of God's comprehensive care. And the last thing to say by way of observation is that comprehensive comprehending of the love of Christ is clearly here a matter of knowing the unknowable. And I pray, he says, that you might know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. If it surpasses knowledge, how can you know it? Well, it's clearly not something that we come to by way of intellect, that we come ultimately by way of rationale, that there is, if you like, no ultimate intellectual road to an awareness of this. If that were the case, then, of course, people who have been given a greater faculty intellectually would have a far greater understanding of the, lo of the love of God, wouldn't they? And those of us who have got, you know, just a size 3 brain instead of a size 14 brain, that we, we would know very little about it at all. We would have to sit next to somebody like that and say, tell me about the love of Christ. But 41 years of pastoral ministry has revealed to me that in some of the tiniest cottages of England, in some of the strangest places, in the company of often godly elderly women, they have taught me things about the love of Christ that clearly is theirs by way of experience and by way of experiment. In other words, they have discovered in the journey of life the dimensions of God's love so that they're able to ponder, for example, with Paul himself when he says, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. I wonder, did he say that with an exclamation mark at the end? Or did he say it with a kind of dot, dot, dot at the end? Did he put down his pen, as it were, when he wrote that phrase and say, really? The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me? You see, it is this that he's then praying for his people, that you would know this love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge. And to the end, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Up earlier in verse 16, when he prays for them to be strengthened in their inner man, as it were, it is to the end that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. There's a sense in which this is just building on the strength of that. What does it mean to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge? What will the end product be? That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul is going to go on in chapter 5 and say, I want you to be filled with the Spirit, that you will go on being filled with the Spirit. The picture there is of God willing to fill to capacity with all the gifts and graces that we require in order to be all that he desires for us to be. And that's why I love it when uh, Jesus argues from the lesser to the greater when he says, if you being earthly or evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Now, as Paul writes these words or dictates these words, he then answers essentially a question. And the question is, how is that going to be? You know, you, 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 to be strengthened in my inner man in this way, uh, that, I'm, that, that this might be the reality of our experience as a church. To, to know that uh, uh, surpass un, uh, the, the, the un amazing love of Christ. He, he answers that. 
but he doesn't answer it, if you like, with a lecture. He answers it with a hymn. And he bursts into song. This is not unusual for Paul, as you know. He, he moves directly to doxology from his instruction. He does it at the end of Romans 11. He does it in 1 Timothy. He does it routinely, and he does it here. And it's instructive for us. That's why this morning, if you like, we are instructed by Jesus in terms of this essential nature of worship in spirit and in truth. And here now, as we come to the end of our time together, uh, we are invited by Paul to enter into the wonder of this as he lifts his voice in doxology. A doxology is just is simply an ascription of praise to God, an ascription of praise to God. And it happens all through the Bible. For example, in the context of the temple in First Chronicles 29, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. You are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor comes from you. You rule over all. In your hand are power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and we praise your glorious name. Because you are, you are, you are, you are. The only legitimate response is to bow before you and to acknowledge this and to praise you. All the way through the Psalms, you have the same thing. In the 100th Psalm, you know, O oh, enter then his gates with praise. Why? For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. You come on the Lord's Day morning, and uh, we're going to sing together, and we're invited to stand and sing. And we're sad in our spirits. One of our kids is not where we would like her to be. We had a call from the hospital to uh, say that the test came back contrary to our hopes and our expectations. Our, our elderly relative, whom we thought would be able to sustain life for another little while in their own home, cannot, and everything is up in the air. The last thing in the world that you want on that morning is somebody to stand up and say, now let's tell God how we're feeling. Because if we were to tell God honestly how we're feeling, we would actually have to use some of the Psalms of lament. We would have to start in Psalm 13, How long, O Lord, will you forget me? Forever? How long must I have sorrow in my heart all the day? So what is the antidote? Not to give expression to how we're feeling, but to give expression to who God is and what God has done. That is why declaratory songs, which have a place where we express how we are, you know, I, I feel this way, or I this, or I that, and there is a place for that. Seldom should we start with that, I would suggest. Far better to start, praise my soul, the King of heaven. So let's get equilibrium here. I just listened to the news or whatever it is, as the whole world has gone to pot. But I just had come into the sanctuary of God. I was envious of the wicked. My foot had almost slipped until I went into the house of God. And then I got it back again. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet. That means I abase myself. To his feet, your tribute bring. Why? Ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Who like thee his praise should sing? Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise the everlasting king. Were well, you singing that song to yourself, actually? Praise my soul, the king of heaven. 
It's between you and yourself and God. You can go on, you know the hymn. Father-like, he tends and spares us. And well our feeble frame he knows. Father, forgive me for acting as if you don't know. Forgive me for walking around as if Matthew 6 wasn't even in the Bible. Father, like he tends and spares us, well our feeble frame he knows. In his hands he gently bears us and rescues us from all our foes. Praise him, widely as he mercy flows. Why? Well, think about it. Frail as summer's flower we flourish. Blows the wind, and it is gone. And I'll be gone. But while mortals rise and perish, God endures unchanging on. You are the great unchanging one. Everything seems to be changing. You see? Tis what I know of thee, my Lord and God, that fills my life with praise, my lips with song. If I look in only on myself, there is sufficient ground for disappointment and despair and recrimination. But it is when I look away from myself to all that God has made true to us in the fullness of his Son and by the enabling of the Holy Spirit that we are then able to enter into his gates with praise. Horatius Bonner, one of my favorite um, hymn writers from Scotland in the 19th century, has written a number of hymns. I hope you sing them. If not, go find them. You might need new melodies for them, but that's your department. Um, but he has a wonderful hymn that begins, that begins, not what I am, O Lord, but what thou art. Now, I just stop there for a moment. There's a start of a hymn in the selfie generation. There are people who come for a whole week, they've been taking selfies. They've been going wrong with that walking stick, taking pictures of themselves everywhere they go. And then and, and they come in and they say, um, well, how is this going to be for me? No, we're going to have the opening hymn. The opening line is, not what I am, O Lord, but what thou art. That, that alone can be my soul's true rest. Thy love, not mine, bids fear and doubt depart and stills the tempest of the tossing breast. Tis what I know of thee, my Lord and God, that fills my life with praise, my lips with song. Thou art my health, my joy, my staff, my rod, and leaning on thee in weakness I am strong. You see, this is one of the reasons when people come into our congregations, if we don't do this, if we are not honest about this, then we come across as the, as the gathering of the smug of the people who've got it all buttoned down. So people come in, they feel broken, disjointed, helpless. If they, if, if they get the sense that everybody in the place has got it all together, then the, 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 there's no place for them to go. There's no opportunity for them to say, I'm a physical wreck. I am emotionally broken. I, 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 I'm, 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 out, I'm out to lunch. But they're not going to sit and tell you that if you like to say, hey. No, but what do we say? We say Jesus is the one who restores our broken lives. You see, there has to be the Corinthians dimension, doesn't there? Such were some of you. You need to know who we are. You need to know. Sexually perverse before Jesus redeemed us. Morally a mess. Lost without God and without hope in the world. It's Jesus. We want to tell you about him. That's why you see... Paul eventually gets to this doxology in light of all the things that he's prayed. You go back through these early chapters of Ephesians. He prays for them that the eyes of their hearts may be enlightened, that you might know this power, that you might be strengthened, that you might comprehend that Christ may dwell in your hearts, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God, so that for all and any, then and now, who are asking, how is it ever going to happen? How will it ever become a reality? The answer is, you are coming to a king. Large petitions with you bring. For his strength and power are such, none can ever ask too much. I think that's Newton. Well, we must hasten towards lunch. But notice that the focus is on him, okay? His person, now to him. Now to him. 
That was how Paul approached the men in Athens, didn't he? What you worship as unknown, I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands. Amazing, amazing summary that Luke provides us there of what must have been an immense oration on the part of Paul on that hill there in Athens. I, I need to tell you, he says, about the God you don't know. He does the exact same thing when he's caught up in the wonder of it, in his concern for his own people, for, for the Jew. And at the end of Romans chapter 11, after he's gone through this whole piece about the Gentiles being grafted in, and then, and then the, the, the Jew will come back, and so on, and it, it, it just, it, he just gets carried away with the whole thing. And what does he do? Then he just bursts into, he starts singing again. He answers it with a, I, I, I say to people all the time, they say, well, I feel a little depressed. I say, buy a hymn book. Buy a hymn book. Take the hymn book, go park your car somewhere, and sing. Open the sunroof if you have one, but whatever. Sing yourself back into position. Sing yourself back in. There's a sense in which that's what Paul does too. He sings himself into it. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. And he says, I'm even writing things here that I can't fully comprehend myself. And then he has these questions, these wonderful questions. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Whoever gave God lessons? Where did God go to learn stuff? Nowhere. He didn't need to. He hasn't had to advertise for management consultants to make it possible for him to rule and rescue the world. He didn't need to find Accenture on the web and have these people come in so that he would know what to do with the universe. There is nobody who counsels God. God is the fount of all wisdom. Who has ever given to God? Who has ever given to God that he might be repaid? Who could ever come to God and say, you owe me? God is able to finance his own projects. He has it all. That's what he's saying here. And why is this? Well, look how he finishes. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. In other words, this is radically different from contemporary views of God and spirituality in the Western culture in which we are now living. God is not in any way dependent on the created universe. God is not contained within the created universe. God is not to be confused in any way with that. In other words, the Bible rules out pantheism, the pantheism that is increasingly part and parcel of our United States. You can find it in the main streets. You can find it in the yoga classes. You can find it just about every coffee shop to which you choose to go. It will be there in one form or another. And our, our friends and our neighbors and our loved ones have all kinds of notions concerning God. And they are encouraged to find the God within them. Well, what were they going to find when they look within them? Well, they're not going to find anything very nice. And those who are on the receiving end of that counsel know that it is a counsel of despair. I go to somebody and I explain all these things, and they say, well, you know, we can help you with this because your problem is outside of yourself, and the answer is within yourself. The person gets back in the car and said, that cost me $75 for somebody to tell me a flat-out lie. If the answer is within myself, why did I ever go in the first place? Why did I ever go and ask the question? The answer is clearly not within myself. You're going to find the God within? That's Hinduism. There are thousands and thousands of gods in Hinduism. That's why they say to one another, Namaste, I worship the God within you, whoever that God is, whatever that God is. The Christianity is so far removed from that because Christianity, when we turn to the Bible, says we are actually alienated from the God who created us. We were created for His purpose and for his glory. We have turned our backs on him. We have rebelled. We have gone our own way. There is, an indiv there is, a, there is an invisible boundary between ourselves and God as creator. There, there is no, we possess no intuitive radar whereby we can contact God on our own terms or in our own time. It is impossible to do. 
The only way that God may be known is by way of revelation. And that revelation has come finally and savingly in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that when we go to people and we tell them and we say, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all you can ask, they say, who are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about the God who created the heavens and the earth. I'm talking about the God that I'm teaching my grandchildren about so that they might know we will tell them, listen, honey, before there was time, before there was anything, there was God. Really, Papa? Really? Let's sing about it. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. He gave us eyes to see them and lips that we might tell how great is God Almighty who has done all things well. This is God, you see. Now to Him, to Him, not a cosmic principle, not a creation of our imagination. A God that you can imagine is no God. And once you've imagined him, you can go and imagine another one and another one after that. No, no, he says. Paul says, I know this God. I met this God. I thought I had him completely encapsulated in my Judaism until on that Damascus road, I realized looking up into that light that was brighter than the noonday sun, and I said, who are you, Lord? Incidentally, that punctuation there I would like to change. I think it should be, who are you, question mark, Lord, which is kurios, which is the, the Septuagint translation of Yahweh. Who are you? Lord. Lord? Yeah. Now, unto him. For you know, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that we through his poverty might become rich. Our view of God, as we said this morning, will determine our approach to God. We used to sing a song in the 60s, I, um, in the stars his handiwork I see. On the wind he speaks with majesty. Though he ruleth over land and sea, what is that to me? I always thought it was a strange song. It sounds even stranger now that I'm saying it. What is that to me? I will celebrate nativity, whatever that, for it has a place in history. So he came to set his people free. What is that to me? Then one day I met him face to face, and I found the wonder of his grace. Now I know that he is not a God who doesn't care, who lives away up there. But now he walks beside me day by day. Now he keeps me in the narrow way. You see, that is conversion, isn't it? That's how we know when a man or woman has been converted. It's not that they decide to exchange one external set of circumstances for another, but they've got an, an entirely new view of Jesus. Who are you? Lord? Completely new view of Jesus. You've got an entirely new view of yourself. I'm Saul of Tarsus. I graduated very nicely. I'm a student of Gamaliel. And uh, my background is, frankly, impeccable. People who know me are just impressed with my righteousness. But mercy was shown to me. Me, the chief of sinners. What's happened? He's been converted. He has a new view of Jesus. He has a new view of God's mercy. He has an entirely new view of himself so that his worship is, if you like, self-abnegation and God's exaltation. Well, our time is virtually gone, but you'll notice that not only is he focused in this doxology on God's person, but also on his power. This God is able, able. Able to do what? Well, 
he's able to do what we ask. Well, he's actually able to do what we ask or think. Well, he's actually able to do all that we ask or think. Well, he's actually able to do far more than all we ask or think. Well, he's able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. In other words, there can be no degrees of difficulty for an omnipotent God. There are no degrees of difficulty for an omnipotent God. You never have to say to God, well, how hard was that? <laughs> it wasn't hard. Why? Because I'm able. So the encouragement in this, I think, is to bring our great request to God, isn't it? To, it's, I, think it's, I think it's an encouragement that's inherent in the text to say, you know, you are coming to a king, large petitions to him bring. God may choose to answer in his time. He may not choose to answer in our time. He will answer in his time, not necessarily in our time. Some of us are going to have to have posthumous joys. In other words, the answers to our prayers will not be revealed to us until we're in eternity. And then we will see that those for whom we have actually prayed and died praying for them have actually been the beneficiaries of God's grace and goodness. May, may it be so. I remember when I was, uh, you know, 19 or 18, I found the verse, Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Oh, I said, this is a beauty. I can't wait. This is fantastic, because I had a number, I had a number of desires, and uh, they were really clear. I had them written down. I'm not going to tell you what they all were, but one of them, one of them was about five foot seven inches tall and, and female. And so I figured out I've got to get the Psalm 37 4 thing working because, and that's one of the reasons I was here in 1972 to track this girl down. And mercifully, God in his kindness included this in his program for me. But I, I was so foolish, I thought, you know, it was a you know, press button A and, and it comes out the other end. But then I thought, maybe I should read the, the rest of the Psalm. What does it mean to delight yourself in the Lord? Well, Psalm 37 goes on, the law of the Lord is in his heart. His steps don't slip. Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you. So again, it's a sort of Psalm 1 experience. The man, he doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. That's what it means to delight yourself also in the Lord. And you will discover then that he who knows what is best for his children will answer according to his purposes. And we will have occasion to be thankful. You see, the reality of the power of God is not academic here. It's not theoretical. You notice he's talking about according to the power at work within us. He includes himself in it. You know Paul well enough in Romans 8, he says, He didn't spare his own son. He gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And it is on account of that that he then ends in this way. To him, the personhood of God, the power of God, and the praise of God. To him be glory. Where? Well, in the church. In the church. In other words, in the bride, the church is where we have a charcoal sketch of what one day will be displayed in glorious technicolor. And so he's praying for these Ephesian believers, amongst whom the unimaginable has happened, because the barrier between them as Jew and Gentile has been broken down, has been removed in Jesus. And so he says, may the glory of God, may the majesty of his purposes and his power be displayed in the church right here in Ephesus. As you gather in your congregations, may it be that when the Ephesian world comes in and looks at you, they say, how in the world did this happen? How, how, how come you people who hated one another are sitting together in this, at this communion service? What has happened here? The answer is, this is what God has done. We can apply it to ourselves, can't we? In the church, God is, if you like, remending his broken world, a world that is broken that will finally one day be fixed in all of its entirety. And in the meantime, the gathering of God's people is an opportunity to show the world 
a microcosm of what God will ultimately complete. So the issues of race, of culture, of class, of education, and of status are not eradicated in the church, but they are transformed by the gospel. So that the very things that separate us from one another, clever enough to get into the school, dumb enough to not get in any school, uh, fast enough to be able to win the thing, so slow that a cart horse could beat you, all of the things by which we're separated from one another, to which we bring to this amazing family as we build with bananas, all of this then finds its answer in the work of the gospel, in the church, and in Christ Jesus, who is the head of the church. We have seen His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And how long will this go on? How long will this take place? Throughout all generations. Throughout all generations. Some generations, all generations. Forever and ever. Forever and ever. It's a Randy Travis song, isn't it? Actually, it's a Paul Overstreet song sung by Randy Travis. As long as old women sit and talk about the weather, as long as old, as, old, as long as old men sit and talk about the weather, as long as old women sit and talk about old men, honey, I'm going to love you forever, forever and ever. Amen. Okay? That's a nice thing. It's Valentine's Day coming up. Just priming your pump for you. You got a chance. You didn't know what you were going to write on the card? Here you go. All the other verses are there. I don't care if all your hair falls out because I'm not in love with your hair. Remember that part as well? You've got it all there. If on a human level we recognize that, if on a human level we see something of it, then here is the wonder of it. Paul says, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all the generations. The older you get, you start to sound like your grandparents. You start to say the things your grandparents said. You know, like this world has gone to hell. This, this thing is over. I mean, there's no way we're going to be able to come back from this. This is unbelievable. Have you seen these pop groups? Look at this stuff. If I dressed like that when I was a boy, they would have put me in an insane asylum. All the same stuff. Why? Because we've got this notion somehow or another that when we wrap it up, it's over. We're going to close the door and it'll be done. No, it won't. Throughout all generations, all generations, so that the generations yet unborn will arise to praise Him. God knows what He's doing. And he will take care of it forever and forever. I'm not concerned about global warming, warming, because he said that seed time and harvest, summer and winter, day and night, will be under his jurisdiction. He's got the security of nature and the cosmos under his control. That doesn't mean you should waste stuff. I get that. But I'm not going to lie awake at night wondering if I'm running out of oxygen. <laughs> Why? Because through all the generations. Think about Daniel in the, in the, um, in the uh, exile. And the people are going, this is, this is over. We're done. We, we, we uh, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and we wept. And we took our harps and we hung them on the willow trees and we said, we're not going to need these. Because after all, how can you sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? It seems that the gods of our, uh, who are opposed to us are far stronger than this God, this Yahweh, this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Daniel steps forward and says, no, 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 no. You've got to understand. You've got to understand. His kingdom reigns forever and ever. Trace it through the generations. Into the temple come Mary and Joseph. They meet the old boy. Simeon. I don't know if he was that old, but anyway. Simeon, who is waiting for the consolation of Israel. And he takes the child Jesus in his arms and he says, I can die now because I have seen my salvation in the person of Jesus. That was 2,000 years ago. Here we are now. What's our confidence? Our confidence is in him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we can ask and ever imagine, so that his glory is displayed in the church and in Christ Jesus through all the generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Father, we pray that your word will find a resting place in our hearts and that we might live increasingly to the praise of your glory. For Jesus' sake we ask it. 
Amen.